let's talk about Genshin Impact as Norse tragedy. Now, it turns out, um, if you actually play Genshin Impact, first off, spoiler alert, uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot of Genshin Impact's actual story, stuff that has been revealed in the game so far. Um, but in Genshin Impact, there is this uh, ancient land called Conria, which uh, went through a cataclysm and was destroyed. And as we learn more and more about Conria, um, they reference specific Germanic myths a lot. So Danesleaf, Alberg, Durin, Dvalin, Rheindotir, um, these all refer back to the Nibelungen song, the Nibelungen lead, which is kind of interesting for a video game to reference a specific myth that closely. And obviously in a lot of games like um, uh, Elden Ring and others, like they'll reference certain mythologies and, and, and weave things in. But to have a specific myth um, pulled in this much, characters and, and weapons and, and such from that, indicates it's probably an important part of Genshin Impact. So let's look at that myth a little bit. Uh, before we go into that, a few assumptions about Genshin Impact we want to start off with. Um, the story is <laughs> uh, uh, the story is about these two siblings who traveled through various worlds and ended up on uh, Tevat, the country of Genshin Impact. And I'm going to assume here that that is true. There are stories and that there are implications that possibly that may not have been as as accurate as is presented in the game. But we're going to uh, assume they are actually interstellar travelers. They spent some time in Conria. 500 years ago, we're, we're assuming that, that that wasn't an illusion or something. Um, also in the game, there are the gods, there is Celestia, and there are the heavenly principles. And they are all used somewhat interchangeably sometimes. And in this video, I'm going to assume that those may be three different factions and organizations. Some of them may be the same, some of them may not be, but we're going to set aside the idea that the gods... Celestia and Heavenly Principles must all be exactly the same faction. That, that'll be important as we go in. Uh, all right. So, uh, let's start by talking about the Nibelungen lead and what the story is of that. So, the main character of the Nibelungen lead is Prince Siegfried, who is your classic kind of warrior hero. Um, he goes out, he leaves his kingdom, he finds this dwarf that he gets this uh, invisible cloak from, he fights a dragon and bathes in its blood to become invincible, except for his heel. Oh, no, I'm sorry, except for a, um, a little bit on his uh, side where a leaf falls on him as he's bathing in the blood. Uh, so he doesn't know it, but he has that, that one weakness. Um, he then ends up traveling to this kingdom that is led by, exactly, like, kind of like Harry Potter. Um, uh, went to this kingdom where he finds uh, King Gunther, and his sister, Princess Kreimhild. Um, and Prince Siegfried goes in and says hello to the, to the king, sees Kreimhild, and immediately uh, wants her as his wife. Right? Um, Gunther says, hold on. Like, I just met you, literally. I'm not going to let you marry my sister, like, today. Hold on. But I'll make you a deal. There's this woman, Qu Queen Brunhilde, uh, who is the leader of a uh, a kingdom full of warrior women. Think think like Amazons, not exactly the same, but given that kind of female warrior culture. And she has said she will only marry a man who completes three physical challenges that she sets. So she does these physical challenges. The man has to do the same physical challenges. If he can keep up she will marry that man. No man has been able to do that. He, uh, King Gunther had tried in the past and had failed. So he's like, so he, he tells Prince Siegfried, if you will help me complete the challenges and win Queen Brunhilde as my wife, I will let you marry Princess Kreimhild. Um, now a few things, depending on the version of this that you read or watch, um, the relationship between Siegfried and Kreimhild are, uh, can be a little different. Um, there was one main version of this that was um, written down and is, is 
considered like the earliest recorded version of the Nibelungen Lied, uh, which is what people go back to, but there were other oral versions going around, so it's not necessarily authoritative in the sense that that was the, the one that everyone would have heard. Uh, that, that is one of them, and then there were others over time. Uh, depending on the, uh, um, the one you read, generally speaking, this was not, uh, generally speaking, Kreimhild sh um, showed some interest in Prince Siegfried. This was not a simple matter of Siegfried saying, give me woman. Uh, there was some mutual attraction there. Uh, again, depending on the version, sometimes it's mild, sometimes it like grows over time, sometimes it's love at first sight, just depends on the version. So there is at least that. So basically, um, Siegfried goes with Gunther to Queen Brunhilde, and with the aid of his invisibility cloak, he is able to essentially complete these challenges for King Gunther, or to aid him in these challenges, and complete all of them. Now, Brunhilde finds this kind of weird. That King Gunther, who couldn't do this, you know, however long ago when he first came out, suddenly is able to, to accomplish all this, you know, no problem. Uh, but she's like, you know what? Okay, fair enough. I agreed. Uh, let me see if we have, uh, if, if we can tell more of this there. Okay, well, we'll get to him in a second. Um, so she goes back with them. Um... But she is increasingly suspicious because King Gunther does not act physically like he's someone who can actually complete the, the things he just did. So when their boat arrives back at King Gunther's kingdom, she refuses to get off the boat. And she says, I don't believe that you are actually, that you actually did it. Gunther then goes to Siegfried and says, okay, tonight I want you to go into the bedroom when it's all dark pretend to be me, and um, to thus prove to Brunhilde that you are, you know, you physically have the ability to do, you know, what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, prove your physical strength. One last time tonight. Uh, Siegfried goes, oh, okay. Goes in. Um, now, here's where it gets interesting depending on the version you read or watch or whatever. Because, um, and we're a little late at night, so I can broach some of these topics. Um, he proves his physical strength to Brunhilde. And notably, he takes her belt. Uh, either a belt buckle or a belt, depending on the version. Now, I want you to think about where physically on somebody's body the belt is and thus what that might symbolize in terms of what happened on that night, right? You further have the implication he's trying to prove his strength. So it is possible that there was some forceful action going on there, and that Brunhilde came out of that, um, let's just say, not in the state that you would want a blushing bride to be on her first night of, of marriage, right? Um, but it is intentionally left um, unexplained and undescribed and symbolic. And this is one of the interesting things about that version of the Nima Logan lead is they, they've, they've said it's, it's interesting that he, that the, presumably the he, the author, um, made it the belt, like didn't describe anything else, but kept it very symbolic so that the audience could decide and interpret for themselves what actually happened. Point being, Siegfried goes back he, he tells Gunther, okay, you know, she believes now. He goes back to Crimehild and goes, I'm kind of shook. Like, I, I'm, I'm feeling kind of weird right now. And uh, Crimehild says, what's up, darling? And he, he says, okay, you can't tell anybody this, but this thing just happened. And shows her the belt. And in fact, gives her the belt. And she basically goes, ew, but... The king ordered you to, so I'm not going to, like, hold it against you, so to speak. Um, you know, you did what you had to do. Fair enough. Um, and, and they kind of go off. Um, so Siegfried is weirded out by this and shows some remorse. Point being, um, you then have, uh, they, you then get a double marriage. They go get married. Everything's cool, fine. Fast forward a little while, 
um, Kreimhilde and Brunhilde are entering a cathedral, and Kreimhilde tries to go side by side with Brunhilde. And Brunhilde goes, wait a minute, no, no, no. Um, I'm the queen, you're the, you know, you married a vassal, you married a warrior. Um, you're, you, you don't rank up here with me anymore. And not like in a, in a super nasty way, but just like from a processional standpoint, like this is gonna look weird if you're up here with me. And uh, Crimehild goes, guess what? Um, actually, the guy you married is not the guy who you thought he was. In fact, guess what happened, you know, the night before your wedding night and uh, shows her the belt. Um, Brunhilde's not happy, as you might imagine, as she realizes she's been lied to the entire time. So she then goes to King Gunther's brother, Brother Hagen. Um, and Hagen is a uh, grim warrior with an eye patch. That's like literally how he's shown uh, in various things. Um, and he's kind of the <clears throat> the general, if you will, of Gunther's you know men. He, he's the the hardened warrior, kind of runs everything. Brunhilde goes and says, um, "My honor has been besmirched, and so the person who did this has to die." And that person is Siegfried. And Hagen goes, you're right, you're right. Like, he should not have done that. He, he, he messed you up, that, he has to die. Uh, and so Hagen, it turns out, knows where the leaf had fallen on Siegfried. Um, when they're out hunting, he lures Siegfried away. Um, and has him, I think he has him like uh, lean over such that his mail um, rides up and reveals the spot and then stabs him. <clears throat> Crimehild is not happy, as you might imagine. Uh, exactly, foreshadowing. Um, because now her husband's dead. Um, so bad things start to happen. This is part one, by the way. <laughs> this is just kind of the first half of the story. Don't worry, the second half is, go, goes faster than this. This is all just kind of set up. Uh, so Siegfried's dead. That, that sucks. Um, Kreimhilde goes off to marry Attila the Hun. Not joking. That is actually what happens in the story. She goes off and marries Attila the Hun. Because uh, that, that is the same time period. Who is kind of a barbarian... Um, uh, Barbarian uh, king is, is the main role of him in the story. Um, Brunhilde exits. Like, she's not in the story. Originally, in the original version, she just isn't mentioned ever again. In other versions of the story, she actually, like, um, you know, throws herself off a bridge or sacrifices herself in, in some way because of all the bad things she did, whatever. Um, point being, she's out of the, out of the story. Kreimhild marries Attila the Hun. Um... And has, a, has his baby, like has his son, and then invites Gunther and Brother Hagen and the other warriors of their kingdom over for a feast. Come on over. Have a great time. It'll be fantastic. So she invites them over and proceeds to orchestrate ways of making each faction angry at each other and create offenses out of how they're behaving and saying, see what that person did? You can't possibly stand for that. See what they did? You can't stand for that. Boils it over, pushes it up, worse and worse and worse. Um, they all die. Um, it just escalates into an all-out war. Everyone dies. Her son dies in the conflict. Um, King Gunther dies, Brother Hagen dies, it just grows, grows, grows. Until the Hun does survive the conflict, because historically he kind of had to. Um, but like, w um, there's a black and white German silent film version of this, and one of the 
the big images of that is Kreimhild standing outside the uh, the main hall that Attila the Hun had, had done, which is on fire with everyone inside it, and she is laughing maniacally, while Attila is off to one side, like on his knees, like crying. Um, yeah, everyone dies. Everyone dies. It is a complete, utter tragedy. Um, uh, part two of the Nibelung Lied is titled in, in that version, um, uh, and in the classical version, Kreimhilda's Revenge. That is the second half of all this. Now, before we get back into Edge and Impact, what's really interesting about this, from a story perspective, is this is basically predicated on a bunch of guys deceiving a woman. Right? The whole point of this is the, the, the reason all this tragedy unfolded is because a bunch of men tried to trick this woman, she found out about it, and kind of everything fell apart. So it's a kind of interesting, almost feminist stance that the story is taking in that perspective. Uh, and then again, they, you know, Crime Hill gets kind of screwed over. She then, you know, precipitates all of all of, all of this stuff. Um, different versions portray her differently, um, uh, as as you might imagine. But that's the basics of this story. So that's the the, the rough overall story of the Nibelung lead. All right. So let's review the functions of all of these characters in the story. Like, you know, what do they do in these stories? So Prince Siegfried is this. Hero who screws up and, and dies as a result of that. So, originally a hero did this bad thing, screws up, and is killed for that. Princess Kreimhilde is the wronged innocent who allies, allies with barbarians to get revenge. Fair enough. Um, Till the Hun is the barbarian ruler. Um, Queen, Queen Brunhilde is just tricked and, and, and screwed over. King Gunther is a greedy ruler who uses trickery and gets his kingdom destroyed for it. So uh, um, not the same as Siegfried because Gunther is not portrayed heroically much in, in the versions of the story, but uh, has a structure of did a thing, pays for it through destruction, in this case of his entire kingdom. And then Brother Hagen is the dutiful warrior who actually does the deed that needs to be done, gets his hands bloody to actually make that happen, right? Where it's like, this needs to be done for justice to be served, and I'll do it, because no one else is going to do it. All right. How might that faction or factor into Genshin Impact? Well, these characters map pretty closely onto certain characters in Genshin Impact. Prince Siegfried maps nicely onto Ermin, the last king of Conria, who is a presumably heroic character who screwed up and was killed for it. We know he died in the Conrian disaster. So he was trying to do a thing, but did it in a bad way, <laughs> in some way, and got killed for that. King Gunther allies nicely onto Rheindotter, not quite as closely, Again, greedy ruler who uses trickery and gets his kingdom destroyed for it. It is quite possible that Rheindotter was um, involved in the Conrian disaster. We know she created a lot of the, the monsters, the rift hounds, things like that. And it, is, it seems likely that that is one of the factors in what got Conria wiped out. Brother Hagen is Dane's leaf pretty much straight up. He is the dutiful warrior who... Apparently, I'm assuming, got his hands dirty in some way. We don't know exactly what he did, but even the Abyss sibling says that Dane's Leaf failed to protect Conria and is thus cursed for that. So, presumably, I think that was a more active role than what is like in, you know, directly portrayed in the uh, in the game. I think he, like he did something that that caused that, or there, there's something more more direct there. What about the other characters go? Though well, I think Prince Cri Princess, Princess Crimehilda maps nicely onto the Abyss sibling. Innocent wronged, who allied with the barbarians, the bad guys, in this case the Abyss Order, to get revenge. Right? For whatever reason, the Abyss that is what the Abyss sibling did. They are allying, allying with the Abyss Order to get revenge in some way. Until the Hun maps onto Clothar. 
the the guy who you know led the abyss, abyss order. Um, Queen Brunhilde maps nicely onto the traveler. The the one who got tricked and screwed over and is at the center of all of this. The fulcrum within which you know all of the story hinges, because something bad was done to the traveler, and um, everything's centered around that. And then we could say that the Valkyries map onto the Heavenly Principles. I mean, they, they fill very similar roles as being the sort of um, heavenly um, warriors. Now, I should point out, um, and I, I should mention this earlier, the Nibon Logan lead is also the basis for Wagner's Ring Cycle, the, the Wagner opera with the Valkyries and all that kind of stuff. Um, it is not the same story, but that was a, a big inspiration for the Ring Saga. So if you've seen... Wagner's Ring Saga, or stories based on it, that's where that's coming from. Um, Wagner invented the Valkyries as we know them, meaning that they, those are, the, the Valkyries were not in the Nibelungen lead, um, but they have become a commonly associated with that storyline. So we can ex expect that the Hoyoverse writing team pulled them in as, a, as an influence. This has some interesting possible implications for the storyline. This tells us Conria screwed up and caused the catac cataclysm. They were not completely innocent. They may not be deserving of the, what happened to them. They may have been, you know, overkill. But it implies that there was something they did which triggered that besides just... Uh, the irrigation of mankind. It also indicates that Dainsleaf did something awful, <laughs> like Hagen did. Um, probably killing, like, the Conria's king or somebody in Conrian uh, royalty, um, which then brought about Conria's destruction. It kind of makes sense for that to be the king, because the king had to die, and it would, would map, up, map, map nicely into the Nibelungen lead. There's another possibility which I learned up, learned up recently, which I'll be happy to go into, which is that he killed the king's daughter. That's a whole other thing. I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that if anyone's cu uh, curious. It also implies the siblings were wronged by Conria. Um, it, it's the Conrian character that is, again, the, sort of the, the, the Gunther faction that screwed over um, the siblings in some way. It also implies the siblings were a major player in the Cataclysm. All of this was woven in. They didn't just show up and then bounce out immediately from the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. They were involved. And I think that is why the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles prevented them from leaving Tevat. That was not the, that was not the Sustainer saying, I don't want you to leave. That was, you screwed up. You're not leaving until you clean up your mess. Right? Um, it also implies... The Abyss Sibling is using the Abyss Order to sow mayhem and cause destruction. The Abyss Sibling, it is possible, doesn't actually care about the Abyss Order's goals. They just want everyone to die. They just want to wipe everyone off the face of the earth. That is their actual goal. They will say, oh yes, I want to do all this stuff for the Abyss Order, because that's what keep the, keeps the Abyss Order in line. But ultimately, they just want everything to burn because of how badly they were screwed over in Conrad. Possible. If this all maps onto the Nibelung Elite. So where will the story go from here? I think we're going to find out more about the Conrian disaster. And it was a case of everyone screwing over everybody else as it happened in the Nibelung Elite. Like it was just people being bad to other people the entire time. So we're going to find it, it is not just, you know, good guy faction versus bad guy faction. Of course, that's not that all of Genshin Impact is finding out. It's not good guys versus bad guys. Everyone has their reasons. And we are in part two of the Nibelung lead. We are in Kreimhilde's revenge. We are in the, the Abyss siblings' revenge. They are just trying to wipe everything out. And if the cyclical nature of Tevat is true that might be fate. It is time for this samsara to end. 
it is time for this version of Tevat to go into its next cycle. And it is the Abyss sibling's goal, or it is the Abyss sibling's role, intentional or not, to start the next samsara, to cleanse the world for the next cycle. Who knows? It's possible. One other thing. What the heck is Paimon? Paimon shows up, washes ashore, um, hangs out with the traveler for two months, and then they decide to go wander around Tevat with Paimon as their guide. No one finds it weird that there's a floating ferry following the traveler around everywhere, which has <clears throat> no other um, similar creature on Tevat. No one's ever seen anything like Paimon as far as we know, but everyone treats Paimon as just normal. Just a thing. Um, reality distortion field, very heavy around uh, Paimon. And I just realized I still have the old panel title on here. Um, let me fix that real quick. That's kind of weird. Granted, for a video game, only so much you can do. Um, now, remember back in the story of the Nibelungenlied, the Princess Kreimhild and Attila the Hun had a child. What if Paimon fills that role? A lot of folks have pointed out that Paimon is similar to the Standard of Heavenly Principles um, character design, white hair, etc., and sort of generally white and gold outfit. But I think she looks an awful lot like at least Lumine. Very close to Lumine. So what if Paimon is Lumine's child? Meaning, if Lumine is the Abyss sibling in your game, Lumine carved off a chunk of herself like a puppet, and sent it to Ether to follow him on his journey. And if, um, and to be a piece of Lumine, traveling with him the entire time, wouldn't that be amazing at the end of this story if we find out that in a way, we've been traveling with Lumine the entire time? And if Ether is the Abyss sibling, Ether created a puppet and sent it along to, to Lumine to be her companion the entire time and made it look like her because that's what he remembers. That's what he wants the most. What an amazing twist to realize. We have been going, spending the entire time with, a, with a, a piece of our brother that he formed in our image, you know, more or less, so that we wouldn't be alone. I think that would be a wonderfully poetic discovery at the end of the game, wherever it goes. I think that would, that would fit surprisingly well. Um, and again, it would fit nicely into the Nibelungen lead plot of all of this at the end. Who knows? Those are all my thoughts and possibilities on Genshin Impact. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, Dane's Leaf did something awful, potentially killing Conry as king. It is also possible he killed um, Conria's daughter because there are implications in the story now that we have in like the, the, the backstory, the lore, that Conria's daughter was Princess Fischl. That is where those stories weave into. That the Princess Fischl in the books, so to explain all of this, the character of Fischl, in the game, is essentially cosplaying as this famous fictional character named Princess Fischl, who did all sorts of crazy adventures. Um, there are hints that the Princess Fischl in the books is based on the, an actual Princess of Conria. So it's not the same character, but the fictional character in the game is a fictionalized version of that girl. If Dainsleaf wants to do something to really mess things up and really cause him to be hated by everyone, 
it would be if uh, the king's daughter did something or was responsible for something and Dainsleaf realized he has to kill her. And he goes in and does that. And again, that would kind of fit in a way more closely with the Nibelungen lead t- tale because you know, instead of kill- killing the king, he's killing the king's associate. Much like um, uh, Siegfried was the king's associate, you know, Fischl is not the king, but closely associated to the king. Um, and that would be why Fischl's been in the game since the beginning. Why do we have this weird cosplaying teenage girl who has manifested this character from fiction in the reality of the game unless she has a major role to play in the actual story where she is actually cosplaying a very important character in the backstory that, that then gets woven in. Who knows? Anyway, that those are the possibilities for what thing was happening with uh, Genshin Impact. Who knows? But, oh boy, does this game have a lot of, of uh, story behind it. And it's kind of exciting to realize where it might be going and how it might be folding everything in. For those who don't play Genshin Impact, by the way, I'm not crazy. Like, this is how deep this game goes. <laughs> Um, you, it's, it's, it's incredible how many myths and elements. Um, Gnosticism is a major inspiration for the game. You, you can find specific like elements of Gnosticism like tied in. It's it's crazy. So yeah, it it it, it could very well all be true.